All right, welcome back. Today I'm excited to welcome musician and record producer Sean Mendelson to the channel. So Sean happens to be the son of Lee Mendelson, who produced over 60 specials featuring Charlie Brown and the Peanuts Gang over the course of his career, in addition to producing a number of Garfield specials, as well as Garfield and Friends, all of which I grew up watching. Some highlights among many on Lee Mendelson's resume include It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown, A Boy Named Charlie Brown, of course, A Charlie Brown Christmas, and what we're here to discuss today, A Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, which originally aired in 1973. In honor of the 50th anniversary of that special, coming up on October 20th, Lee Mendelssohn Film Productions is putting out the complete Vince Guaraldi soundtrack for the first time ever in CD, digital, and vinyl formats, for which Sean serves as producer while contributing the liner notes as well. Sean, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. And I like your, your YouTube channel quite a, quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so tell me, I guess, uh, to get things started, how did you get involved in the, uh, in the family business? So I have three older siblings and they have, they're in most of their lives have been very much involved with Lee Mendelssohn film productions in various ways. Um, my sister's in HR and accounting, my, my brother, my brother, Glenn was the vice president of the company for many years. And then near the end of my dad's life, uh, just five, 10 years ago, my two brothers became the co-presidents of the company. Um, and then when my dad passed away in tw uh, December, 2019, uh, Christmas, I ironically, uh, my two brothers, you know, took over the company more, more fully. And uh, I just happened, I was doing my own thing. I was the one kid that wasn't part of Lee Mendelssohn film productions. And just before he passed, um, my dad and I came up with an arrangement where I would work in the music department of Lee Mendelssohn Film Productions and the licensing of the Garaldi music. And one of the first tasks my brother gave me was a menial job of just tracking all the tracks from these uh, uh, shows, these peanut specials. And that's where all this kind of started. So that sounds a little bit like a uh, sort of a, a pandemic uh, project. <laughs> Yes, it, it just it fell in our laps. Uh, like a lot of people, we my brother was looking for where we could move. Uh, my brother Jason, who also co-produced the album with me, was looking for where the music was in, in physical form and what we could do with it. And one of the first things I discovered listening, because I, I grew up listening to this. In the 80s, I grew up listening to Vince Guaraldi. My dad would play it just casually in the car. They were professionally linked. My dad's the one who brought Vince Guaraldi to the Peanuts specials. He convinced Schultz, who was more of a classical enthusiast, to use it. And so when I when I um, when I discovered rediscovered this music, listening to these specials, I said, these these cues, these what are amounts to background music, are better than this. They're they're the little nuggets of uh, melodic uh, candy, if you will. And so when my brother, who had already been looking for these records, was, was saying, we got to find them, I said, not only we should we find them, we got to release these as full soundtracks. There's enough meat here musically to keep everybody happy and, and remind them of their childhood. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's interesting. So I'm thinking um, over the last year or two, uh, we've been treated to, let's see, soundtrack releases from both the Charlie Brown Christmas, as well as It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. So with so many peanut specials that are out there, there obviously there must be a ton of musical content. So what, what made you want to tackle a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving next? Well, you know, uh, I can say we've, we've found a lot. We found a lot of stuff that a lot of people are going to be very happy about, including myself. When we first, the first thing we found was uh, the soundtrack for you're in love, Charlie Brown. And I kid you not, blood drained from my face. I felt like Indiana Jones in the temple of whatever uh, discovering. And I know you could appreciate this in an audiophile who listens to stuff and listens to the intricacies of it. We heard all this, all this great stuff in studio talking, the development of the music in the studio. And so when we started finding different things, we said, uh, well, we got this, the pumpkin and actually to back up a little bit. There was a release in 2018 of the great pumpkin which wasn't very good. It had sound effects and it had, uh, and this is predates my involvement. So I like comfortably talking about it. Uh, and so when we discovered uh, a, a great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, um, we immediately tried to rectify that error last year by releasing that one first. That's why that one came out. Uh, we did that with Concord Records and Mark Pirro who produced it with Jason and I uh, for that release uh, last year, 2022. 
So this year, when we were talking about what to release next, it made the most sense since it is the 50th anniversary, 1973 to 2023, a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. We like this one a lot, and we think it's a great showing for uh, a rep the first real representation of Vince Guaraldi's soundtrack from the 70s is what it comes down to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, so Vince Guaraldi, unfortunately, didn't have a very long life. And, you know, he, he did put out a number of albums, at least for fantasy records. Um, and I'm trying to think where he might have gone after the fact. But I'm almost wondering if what you have sort of, you know, quote unquote, in the vault is, is like, you know, potentially more than anything that was ever put out by Guaraldi during his lifetime in terms of studio albums. Well, what I can say, it's kind of, um, it's a double-edged sword. So we're, ta we're talking generally music cues, right? So these, these are always generally shorter things. So for example, Charlie Brown Christmas, they intended to release it with the show and as, as a standalone album. And that's why you have, you know, O Tannenbaum these, and these other songs that are four or five minutes long because they had the full intention of releasing him. So when Guaraldi made this soundtrack, he, I don't think he had the intention of releasing the music. And so from that standpoint, it's very much its own lane of being a soundtrack album, um, you know, that we're putting out now so people can hear it without the sound effects, without all the extra stuff. And, and, and I'll answer your question more specifically in a second. But the, but the coolest thing is of all the shows I watched that Garaldi did the score for, which is 15 specials from 65 to 75. And like you said, he died uh, the night after his last recording show session for Arbor Day, Charlie Brown. It was the day after his last peanut special recording, which is just crazy. It, right there where I am right now in Menlo Park, I'm in San Jose, California. And it was in Menlo Park on a gig between sets that he died. Um, so yes, so what, what we found are things that have never been heard before. So that's what's exciting. Now, these things that have never been heard before are still in the mindset of short cues. So the irony here is jazz is usually long form, as you know, Chris, and, and, and it's all about improvisation and extension. And, and I, in fact, we've, we've talked to a lot of the sidemen, and we even talked uh, recently to uh, Larry Vukovic, who was his, considered his only student ever. And Larry talks all about how uh, you know, he wishes Geraldi got more attention for the non-peanut stuff because it is such long form traditional jazz. But this, but what we found is still special. It still has beginning, middles and ends. It still has uh, uh, accessible melodies. So it's its own animal, even though they're shorter and they're not sort of traditional jazz form, it still has that jazz sensibility and it still has that connection to everybody's innocence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I actually uh, went and and, uh, and watched this, uh, watched the full special um, yesterday, just, you know, kind of in preparation to sort of refamiliarize myself. And, you know, what, what kind of struck me, and, and you, you alluded to this earlier. So this original special aired in 1973, which was eight years after a Charlie Brown Christmas. And even though this, this special very much has sort of that timeless quality to it, and in fact shares many of the same visual elements as well with sort of the painted backgrounds and the animation over it, the soundtrack here feels very much a product of the 70s. Um, and so I, I'm curious, like, why do you, why do you think that is? What, what about it is, is, you know, makes it sound 70s? I, I, I love that question. Uh, to me, if I were to write a thesis about Garaldi, Using these 15 specials he made, you get, to, I mean, we're talking 1965, right? Where jazz is still at its height or maybe coming down a little bit. And then the rock and roll is taken over from 65 until, you know, modern day even. And so what happens is this transition from 60s to 70s, the recording, you know, all these, all the recordings, the first four or five specials are in mono. Then from 1970 to 1976, and you know, there's seven, eight more specials they're all in stereo. So we have a new mixing process that goes on in stereo. We have Garaldi dabbling. He, he, he leaned into the mainstream. He leaned into pop and rock where a lot of jazz players at the time would push it aside and say, I'm hardcore. I want nothing to do with it. So you can hear, in my opinion, when you listen to even songs from that he wrote in 1967, which is on this album, uh, Peppermint Patty, um, there, there's a, there's a melodic sensibility that lends itself to pop music, but what he still has underneath it are those lush jazz harmonies. And that's the brilliance of Vince. So as time went by and the seventies came in, he brought in Seward McCain on bass, who was a jazz fusion bassist. He brought in Mike Clark, the great Herbie Hancock drummer 
who brought what's called the East Bay sound, the David Garibaldi uh, sounds of funk from the New, uh, Oakland area. And he was always about pushing forward. And that's what this specific album represents. It has this funkier edge because of, of uh, Mike Clark. It has Tom Harrell and his jazz arrangements, which are classy and cool. And Tom Harrell's a legend uh, trumpeter and arranger. And it has Seward McCain. And these guys were all half his age. Uh, Vince was probably 42, 43. These guys were all in the early mid twenties and he surrounded himself with the youth, with what was next. And yeah. the experimentation he's singing, he sings little birdie on this. A lot of people don't know that he plays guitar. He plays guitar. I actually almost forgot to add it to the back of the, the, the cover of, of, for what you'll see on the album. He, he doesn't play guitar well. Everyone will say that, but he plays it good enough that you respect it. You're like, oh man, this great pianist is adding guitar to a song called, Is It James or Charlie? And it's not the last time he does that. He's layering. He's got a clavinet. He's got a Wurlitzer, a grand piano, uh, a, 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 a horner. He's got four different tracks for Pepper and Patty overdubbed and laid. In the 60s, he would just be one piano. The 70s, means experimenting, layering, different keyboards. He got the first, my dad told me he was one of the first people to have a Moog synthesizer. So he's one of the first people in jazz to incorporate. And then it's debatable as it gets more to the, his last show is his good sport, Charlie Brown. It can, it gets almost maybe overly synthesized where everything is just a synth, a synthesized journey. And so that's, that's up to the fans to determine what they like or don't like about Garaldi. But there's no question he took risks and there's no question he adapted to what was going on in the music around him in the 70s. Yeah, very interesting. I'm even thinking, I guess, outside of the context of the uh, the, the Peanuts specials, even the Black Orpheus soundtrack that he did jazz impressions of, um, you know, I know a lot of people give sort of Stan Getz and, and, um, and others kind of credit for popularizing Bossa, but it feels like he was kind of at the entry point on that as well. Um, experimenting with that style in a jazz context. Um, so that's, that's a hundred, a hundred, a hundred percent. I mean, even when you think about the most famous Linus and Lucy, the left hand, boom, ba -da, boom, ba -da, it has this Latin feel to it. And then, yeah, it breaks back into a traditional swing halfway through the song, but he, he played in the Bay area with Cal Jader, you know, all over. And so there was definitely a Latin influence. And, and that's the other thing that's fascinating about it. He, when he found the Latin thing, he just sort of, went with it and pushed it and, and went, like you said, with Black Orpheus. And, and you can hear that all over. Um, you can hear that all over his music. There's boogie woogie influences on these peanuts tracks throughout the 15 specials, everything that he heard out in the world. And he did on long form and club gigs or, you know, heard coming out the new sound jazz over here. He would, he would infuse that. He would incorporate that. And from what I gather from all the people with all the side people that he's worked with, they would like literally sit around and you'll appreciate this once again as a vinyl enthusiast and they would just sit and listen to records, whatever was coming out, you know, and, and it would, it would tell them where to go. Um, but I think, I think, uh, and also I mentioned this earlier, the electric bass is very much a prominent part of, of the seventies landscape. He, he and Stuart McCain agreed that that would be the underpinnings of, of basically all the specials, from 1971, played again Charlie Brown all the way until Arbor Day, his last uh, special. I don't think he played stand up bass again. So that's an interesting little side nugget. Yeah, interesting. And and so what, one of the things that I've kind of noted as well is is how much he changes the style, but even the voicings um, within a single special. And and so it seems to me, you know, when I'm when I was watching this uh, this particular one the um, conversation between say Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty over the phone has a very different tone to it than when you're outside, right? Or when, um, you know, it's just Snoopy and Woodstock. Snoopy and Woodstock live in a completely different world. And that's, that's what invites um, Little Birdie. And, and that's what invites that March theme with uh, when Snoopy's putting on the Pilgrim hat and the, I thought it was harpsichord, but when you said clavinet, it was probably that. It's, it's really interesting to, to see yeah, these some of these unusual instruments and the mood just completely change depending on what's going on on the screen. What what draws me to music in general is dynamics and meaning not just like fast and slow songs, but different approaches. If every song has the exact same setup or the exact same feel, then I even if it's something I love, I'm going to tend to get bored. When you look at a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, you just pointed to it. Peppermint Patty. By the way, this is the first time the Peppermint Patty 
um, even though this has been released, Pepper Patty has been released before, this version, 1973, um, is the first full-length version where it has this bridge, sort of this gritty, almost chromatic bridge section to it that was subsequently, in a previous special, You're in Love, Charlie Brown, separated out. And when you hear Peppermint Patty on the phone with Charlie Brown, that's the song or the piece of music that has four different uh, keyboards, one grand piano, Wurlitzer, clavinet, horn, honer. And what it creates for that particular scene is this ethereal dreamlike sound. It has this kind of these four, it's almost like a ballet, if you will, of four different uh, keyboards, all Giraldi playing it in overdubs fashion. And then you go right into this blues song outside with Little Birdie with Vince, by the way, who had to convince my father that he could even sing it and did soundly. Uh, his, his soul is perfectly in place for that blues song and the juxtaposition of those one track after the other. And then you go into this uh, the Thanksgiving interlude, the Thanksgiving theme, which is uh, in three and has a totally different feel there. It sounds, as, I, as you'll see in my liner notes, it sounds like leaves falling, which is exactly what it evokes in the show, the four times the Thanksgiving themes used. And then, like you said, what sounds like the harpsichord is in fact the clavinet on the theme fife and drums, the fife and drums theme. And, and I mentioned this again earlier, just a year prior, Stevie Wonder, 1972, was making um, the clavinet a cool instrument. It was becoming, you know, even though it sounded like a harpsichord, people were like, what is that? It doesn't sound like somebody playing keys it very much became a part of the zeitgeist. And there's no question, I think, well, maybe there's a question, but I do believe it influenced um, Vince's desire to put the, that timbre, uh, uh, that stamp on this this particular special. You know, it's, uh, it's funny. This is one of those specials that, um, you know, maybe it's because of where I spent Thanksgivings um, and we didn't necessarily always have the TV on, but it, it's, it feels at least for me, this is a special that I almost rediscovered a little bit in my adulthood where when I saw it, I remembered it and I certainly had nostalgia for it. And I remember hearing, um, I remember hearing when little birdie came on for the first time, it was like, I got goosebumps because I hadn't even thought about that song in so long. And it's such a, it's such an interesting and really a beautiful inclusion here. I think, uh, in the, uh, in the soundtrack, I would, I love, I love it. And I, and I can't say enough that uh, I talked to the trombonist who lives in San Francisco, Chuck Bennett, who's on this uh, album as well. He he said how much Tom Harrell, who puts the trombone and trumpet arrangement together for Little Birdie and the Thanksgiving theme reprise too, and the fife and drums and Linus and Lucy. This this guy, it, it's profound what his arrangements in in co how much they complement Vince's um, pieces of music, and I, I they work in such perfect harmony together. Um, that they they ended up doing five or six shows together, pe peanut specials. Tom Harrell came back to do to to do more after that. Um, but but the Linus and Lucy, the combination of Tom Harrell and the uh, and the funk drum pattern, which is basically introduced to Linus and Lucy on this special, uh, and they even have this sort of um, this little tag at the end, bump 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 bump, that little backbeat at the end of the phrase, which was introduced. It to me personally. A lot of people will say it's a great pumpkin. Charlie Brown has the best line of Lucy and no, no knock to that because the flute lines from Ronnie Lang who plays on that are fantastic. This is my personal favorite, maybe because I have my own personal leanings towards rock music, but I just love, it is just a glorious rendition of Linus and Lucy. It's four and a half minutes. I think uh, compared to like a couple minutes, the original on Charlie Brown Christmas was, and they just butter it up and it just goes, just goes up and up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the inclusion of, of Linus and Lucy. And obviously it's the, it's the, sort of the pivotal, you know, theme and you could say, Oh, they kind of, they kind of have to, but they, they, I mean, they didn't have to, and, and they twisted it a little bit and made it into something else. And to, to your point about, um, gosh, the leaves falling and how that was sort of evoked by the music. It's almost like in the Charlie Brown Christmas with the snowflakes falling. Um, but again, didn't, you know, didn't go with that, um, precise music, but still was kind of, I don't know, still embodying what was on the screen. Yes. Um, yeah, just in a really nice way. So, so you, you mentioned a, a few of the, um, well, I think really the entire lineup and, and I was actually going to ask you to what extent some of these folks stayed on for future specials. Yes. Um, so you mentioned Tom Harrell continued to be involved. We also had Mike Clark, uh, Seward McCain, Chuck Bennett, yes. uh, on this, uh, on the special as well. Did that, did that group stick around and was this their first one together? So it's, it's fascinating because first of all, 
I think I can say Vince Guaraldi didn't take the most copious notes. The actual track names were sometimes wrong on the original cue sheets that we had to look over. And we had to kind of piece together and figure stuff out. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it was unclear even who was playing what instrument. And so we weren't sure we may not have to say anything. But um, in the case of his sidemen, I'll, I'll start with Mike Clark. Mike Clark started touring with Giraldi before he was famous. He became, I think, a, a jazz, a famous jazz person with Herbie Hancock around this time, around 1973. But from like 67, maybe 68 till 73, he, he toured on and off with Vince Giraldi along with a lot of uh, other drummers. So they already had established a language. And, and again, I think when Mike Clark started tapping into that funk sound, this particular tower of power, David Garibaldi's sound, uh, Vince wanted to harness that. He wanted to bring that in and make use of that for, for his desires. And, and, and so Mike did two specials. He did it's a mystery, Charlie Brown, and a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. Seward McCain is the longest running touring musician and the most used personnel. I think he did eight specials, eight peanut specials on bass. And all the 70s ones basically are with Seward McCain on bass. Uh, he had some one offers. He had Chuck Berghofer play bass on Play It Again, Charlie Brown. And Chuck didn't even remember because he was part of that uh, the Wrecking Crew, which is that awesome you know, re recording unit that they've made documentaries about. And so some, some guys would come and go, but a lot of these guys stuck by Vince right up until the end. In fact, Seward McCain was at the gig that where he, where he tragically passed away at the age of 47 in 1976. Um, and so th they all spoke about their love and appreciation for Giraldi as a person and Giraldi as a craftsman. And it shows up. And that's why when you hear some of these tracks and you hear a little bit of banter in here, and even when you hear last year in 2022's uh, Charlie Brown Christmas release, you hear all that stuff in between. As a fan, hearing these people communicate and the camaraderie, it's a real cool peek behind the curtain of what it was like. And he was an enigmatic guy. Didn't give too many interviews, Vince Guaraldi. So that, that's why I think it's important not only to have the music, but to get a sense of what it would be like as, you know, fly in the wall in the studio and, 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 and that part of the process too. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think especially with jazz, because there's almost this, um, a lot of folks believe, you know, or feel this sort of mystique around it because of how much is, um, is created spur of the moment through improvisation, but, but even more than that in soundtracks and scores, I mean, a lot of the details get ironed out in the studio and, yeah. and fortunately some labels, you know, allowed musicians that, uh, that flexibility, especially later on, whereas early on, it was kind of like, you know, you're getting paid by the hour. So record what I need you to record and get out. Right. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I really appreciate um, all that additional content that's sometimes added on because it does give you a little bit of a window into the process that otherwise seems like it's a little bit, you know, sort of obscure. Well, it's always, it's, it's tough because there's a lot of it. I, and I actually, when they released the 2022 Charlie Brown Christmas, they released all of it. I mean, every possible, it felt like every possible sound, that they had, they put out there and it's fantastic. I mean, I listened to that and that's what it was like when we first heard you're in love, Charlie Brown. There's this, there is this, like you said, a mystique. It's this magic because making music isn't just about people getting together and making music. It's about this underlying communication, this emotional palpable feeling that you have that infuses the music. And I think that's part of why this music is so special. These guys all work in tan especially jazz musicians. There's a, there's an unspoken language there when they play these gigs, when they can go on for five, 10 minutes and just improv and know who goes next. And like, I'm, I remember hearing stories that Vince would swap instruments. He'd go play drums. And somebody, I mean, you don't do that uh, anymore. Uh, there's, so there's this element of this, this particular time, this particular um, interest in that camaraderie. And it's, you can feel the love as it were. Yeah, so I'm I'm thinking so I guess for for folks out there who who are kind of interested maybe in some of this lineup. So Tom Harrell, who who by the way I just saw him at the Village Vanguard. Um, it must have been last year, and it, he put on a great set. Uh, he's obviously getting up there a little bit in uh, in age, but um, so so Tom Harrell uh, shortly after the recording of uh, of this music would go on to join Horace Silver and play on a variety of his Blue Note albums: Silver and Brass, Silver and Voices, Silver and Wood. There's, there's a number of releases. It was silver and something. <laughs> and, uh, and he played on, on basically all of those and, and he's still around. 
Yeah. You've got Mike Clark, who you said kind of, uh, you know, would go on to record with Herbie, uh, Herbie Hancock. He was on Thrust, Death Wish, Man Child, a lot of those like really great um, 70s, later 70s uh, recordings. I believe that he's still with us as well. So oh, yeah. Kane and Chuck Bennett, I think, are still with us, which they means are. that. So, the, the, I mean, outside of uh, outside of the uh, the, the leader, um, right. everyone is still with us, which really must, I mean, it showcases how young they were and to your earlier point about uh, Goraldi wanting to work with kind of the up and comers, right? Well, what's what's crazy about that, and, and I will say the two of the most famous sidemen, we, we lost both of them in the last couple of years, uh, Colin Bailey, who played drums on Cast Your Fate and Charlie Brown Christmas, and Jerry Grinelli, who also played on uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. These guys did, they wore his, in his demographic and they're sort of, they were up there in their age. And, you know, whereas Vince died so prematurely, it's a strange thing because I'm when we've been talking to all these guys who are now in their 70s and 80s, you know, they were 20 something years old hanging out with Vince Guaraldi. And it's like a parallel dimension because it was 50 years ago that this was all going on. Um, but it, it's it, it, these guys are all journeymen. They all they all still play. Mike Clark was playing out. He had two gigs out here when we, we talked to him and met with him. And we got we actually got him to play uh, some of these Thanksgiving songs for us, uh, but then more on that later. So um, so it, it looks like, and you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong. I I, I saw the uh, the sort of press release for this upcoming album. It looks like there's about 38 minutes of content on the soundtrack that's uh, being put out, which is a little bit longer than the actual TV special. So it, it sounds like there's some new material or potentially alternate takes here that that weren't originally included. Is that right? That's exactly right. And 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 that's the that's the extra, that's like the cherry on top because I know everybody wants to hear the soundtrack, but what's special about what we're releasing here and like we did with a with a it's a great pumpkin Charlie Brown like for example on it's a great pumpkin Charlie Brown there's the it's um the waltz uh the bonus track which I think was the most popular track they might have released it as a single where there's the Celesta uh that Garaldi plays just a little bit at the sort of bridge or in, at the two thirds mark of the great pumpkin waltz. And in the same fashion, we got cool stuff here that no one's heard before. It's almost novelty. The first one we kind of are letting people hear is, is it James or Charlie, which we call, is it James or Charlie, Charlie bonus mix with whistling. He does this technique, which I've never heard anywhere else. And he did it in the sixties too, but he does it. And we present it here where he whistles a melody, a variation on the melody for, is it James or Charlie while simultaneously playing those same notes on piano. Like Jimi Hendrix used to sing and play the guitar, you know, in that same respect. But what it does is because the human voice ebbs and flows and doesn't hit the notes perfectly in the center like a piano, it almost creates this effect that the piano's bending. And so the song, it's kind of weird, but it's kind of cool. Is it James or Charlie bonus whistling mix? So that's one of the little pieces of candy we have. We also have a Linus and Lucy, the famous Linus and Lucy uh, version I was talking about with with an entirely new keyboard part, a counter melody that's never been heard before. That's a bonus mix. Um, there's a peppermint patty we put on here that's basically without the drums and bass, so you can hear those four different keyboard tracks just isolated. And I, I thought that would be a fun, really cool thing. And Terry Carlton uh, came up with that, actually. He was the engineer on this. Uh, he mixed this. And then we have we have some really quick ones. There's like a 10-second cue. Uh, that is the Thanksgiving theme played at lightning speed. It's like that. And I just, there's little things in there. I think people will be excited about. Um, and then we, we close the album with a thing we, we titled Clark and Garaldi. It's just the two of them doing that East Bay sound, working out this part that would never ended up in the show. And that's completely never been heard anywhere before and it's just them working it out it's not even a full piece of music it's a germ of an idea them figuring it out and oh and then you know what the most exciting thing about all of this to me is you get a sense of how this again enigma uh of a craftsman vince garaldi created this music so we took this little interlude it's called thanksgiving interlude and he did more takes of this than any other special we've heard he did i think ended up doing like 17 takes somewhere between 14 and 17 takes we included them they're very short they're like 15 20 sec maybe 30 second things and you hear how the germ of an idea starts out as just this little swing dun, 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 with the bass line and the simple piano chords and then it gets faster on the next take faster on the next take then they do the east east bay funk sound the east bay sound 
uh, where all of a sudden it takes on an entirely different feel. And what you glean is how Garaldi gets from one place to another. And as a musician and as an, as an audiophile like yourself, uh, I can't think of anything more exciting than hearing how the creation of these little cues came to pass. Absolutely. This is, um, this is really interesting because even more so than say just alternate takes where it really was just, you know, say Vince Guaraldi's trio and it's just kind of like, you know, working through different things. The idea that there's these different, um, these different layers because of, because of overdubbing and, and these different tracks almost, almost creates this like idea that there's even more possibilities of what's out there with some of this, uh, some of this material. So that's really exciting. And, and just, I, I also, I just want, I want the fans to know that as my place in this is uh, so I, it's nepotism. I'll straight up. My dad produced the show. My dad wrote Christmas time is here. And now my position where I've, I've kind of just recently come comfortable with just in time to get this all going is I'm a steward. I'm a curator, if you will, for, for, of this music for the Vince Guaraldi fans. So I, I want to impart that, that I'm coming from a place again, also of love. And so what's included is what I would want to hear. And so we're in the, I was in the studio with, with my brother and the engineer hours and hours working this out. And so uh, some of this has been released before, you know, some is brand new, but we just want people to hear what we think Vince would want uh, people to hear. And when you hear the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving soundtrack, as I mentioned earlier, it's so low in the mix. Sometimes you can't even hear the bass and the drums at all. So this will be the first time you'll be hearing some of those appropriately balanced, hopefully sounding the way we want in the most authentic way. And uh, I just can't wait for the fans to, to hear it. Yeah, no, that's, that's really exciting. So, so one, one really quick uh, question, yeah. and then I, I want to talk about the, uh, the actual sort of uh, the, the physical release sure. here. Um, and you, I didn't, you may not know the answer to this, but I'm curious. So we all know that the adults are voiced with a trombone. And I understand that in, um, in this particular special, um, adults are only implied uh, when the kids are riding in a car on the way to grandma's house. And, and otherwise, I don't believe that we hear that, um, that trombone vocalization. My understanding is that Frank Rossellino uh, at least did some of that early work. Do you happen to know how that came about, though? How, how you know, who, who came up with this idea? It's a, it's a great question. Um, and I will tell you, uh, there's a few different answers you'll hear. You'll, if you look at the history books as it were, my dad had, uh, one answer that it was just someone screwing around with a trumpet in the studio with Vince and then Bill Melendez or my dad heard it or Vince heard it. So I don't know who the individual that gets credit for is, but from listening to these things, there's so much just kind of casual workshopping that you could see literally someone in the studio in 1967 when that was introduced, the idea of the, you're right, is Frank Rosalino who's doing it. He plays the trombone as an adult the first time. Uh, you can hear them playing with it. Much like there's an innocence and a playfulness to the show and to Schultz's comic strip, that it, it, it transcends that content and ended up in the studio. The 1960, the cool, one of the coolest things, Chris, is the 1967 You're in Love, Charlie Brown, the first thing I heard in April of 2021, is Bill Melendez, the animator, saying, hey, what are you doing over by that window? And then the trombonist, Frank Rosalino, picking up a trombone. <laughs> so they're feeding the lines, and then the lines are inflected with, with conductor John Scott Trotter, who helmed a lot of these things in the 60s with Vince, uh, the inflections to match the voice. So I never knew that there were actually written lines. That is, that's really cool. It's, it's interesting, especially because it's almost one of these um, in, in the grand scheme of everything that's ever been animated, especially when kids are the focus, it's treated differently, you know, over the years. Sometimes you, sometimes, sometimes the adults show on, show up on screen. Sometimes you only see them from waist down, right? They enter the screen, but the camera stays very much focused on the kids. And in this example, it's just interesting to have that kind of, you know, typically off-screen, vo you know, vocalization that, that, um, that you know, still makes the, uh, the shows about the kids and, and highlights, again, a little bit of that sort of innocence. Um, it it almost, almost like we're indifferent to what the adults are saying um, because, because the kids are in their own world. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, such, it's such a simple and profound technique that they employed with, with, that, with that effect, you know, and it's... Um, 
it's it's endearing and it makes sense and it, it translates again from comic strip to an audio uh, visual medium. So you know because obviously Schultz didn't have uh, adults walking around and talking in his strip either. So this was a way to get around that effectively, you know. So, um, all right. So, so this release is coming out on October 20th. Um, it's, it's gotta be fair to say that this is going to sound pretty good, right? Because the, uh, the Christmas, uh, special obviously sounds great. The, uh, you know, great pumpkin sounds great. Um, is, is it fair to say that the original tapes were in pretty good shape for this one? They, they wore, it's amazing because my brother and I oversaw, we sent uh, it's a great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, and that was mono and directly mastered by Vincent Hudson, who also is mastering this. This, this guy is a scientist. He had a, he, back in the 90s, he worked with uh, uh, Whitney Houston and all these other people, and he's, he's kind of a behind-the-scenes guy, but a uh, fantastic guy who restored this, and Deluxe is the peop- are the people that took the original tapes. Deluxe are the people that took the original tapes, and they had to be baked, you know, and they had to be worked on, and we, we were surprised at how good the quality. I think the, the noise floor is, is pretty, pretty good. Uh, when, when I've, when I've a beat it, cause we a beat it with existing material from Thanksgiving that's been released. We've a beat it with Charlie Brown Christmas. We've a beat it with, and, and by that, I mean, we always are trying to compare so that we're in the right neighborhood of how it's supposed to sound. Um, I, I it's, I think people are going to be really, really happy, really happy with, uh, what they get. No, that's excellent. So safe, safe to say because it's 38 minutes. So we've got we've got a single disc release, um, and it sounds like it's there's going to be a few different varieties of, though of this one in addition to a standard black version. Isn't that right? So uh, yes, we're releasing. We're uh, I know with the Charlie Brown Christmas they released a dozen different versions of of the thing, and it's exciting because there are all these different versions. Uh, we're only releasing three different vinyls: the standard black, the the Target cranberry red. And the jelly bean green for record store day, and we're all very excited about about that. So we're we're limiting it, but it seems appropriate to have the jelly bean color and the and the Thanksgiving cranberry color. Uh, and of course, we have a release on CD, and it's going to be digitally available as well. And I want to point out what's really important about this is that it's the first time the full soundtrack is available uh, in one place from the best sound source we have, and so. Um, that's another thing I want to point out is we, we were super excited about this fidelity and we hope the fans are as pleased as we are. No, that's great. And, and that's a, that's a good point because I want to say that, um, snippets, um, of the, of the soundtrack have appeared on other compilations, but this is the first time independent of all that additional content that no one's ever heard of, you know, ever, uh, ever heard. Cause it isn't in the special, this is going to be the first time that everybody gets to hear sort of the the full soundtrack in a in a standalone release so that's uh, very exciting that's right so um would it be accurate to say that there may be more to come in terms of uh you know you don't have to give away anything but in terms of unearthing soundtracks from some of the other peanut specials going forward there are we have found a lot we found uh, i i we have found most of it and it's at various stages of development that's what I can say about um, the other soundtracks, uh, and and what's exciting is each special has its own unique vibe, you know. And th- in this case, I think Tom Harrell and Mike Clark very much represent the sheen, this sort of funk meets classic horn arrangements sheen. Um, couple that with the layering of keyboards, so I think that's what makes a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving soundtrack so distinctive and so appealing. Well, um, yeah, Sean, thanks. Thanks very much for taking the time today. Um, I know that there are a lot of Charlie Brown, uh, Charlie Brown fans out there, a lot of Vince Guaraldi fans uh, as well, who are going to be really excited uh, for this release, as well as just obviously the continued work of your family to preserve and make available all of this great music. Um, so again, the soundtrack to a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving is going to be released on October 20th. It's available for pre-order now at mvdshop.com. And I'm actually going to uh, put a link in the uh, description and maybe over the video here so that folks can go uh, go over there and check it out. Um, but, uh, but thanks again, Sean. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for being a fan of Garaldi and vinyl. And I, I appreciate your, your time today. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I will see you next time. Mm-hmm.